Welcome to the 27th Degree with Chris and Nancy from 27 Degrees Consulting. So our guest today is Dr. Jennifer Goss here to discuss breast health. And this is an exciting um, podcast for us because it's our 50th. Yes. Hard to yep. believe, our 50th podcast. So we're really excited to uh, to do this today. Um, before we begin our conversation, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Bay Coast Bank. Bay Coast Bank is just right for all of your financial needs. Visit baycoast.bank or call 508 508- Six seven eight seven six four one to learn more. I'd also like to thank Ron Gamash for our intro music, and the PC Institute for producing our show. So, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Oh, thank you for asking. So, um, I am a, a breast surgeon in uh, Southern New England. I did my training in general surgery, and uh, finished that training in Philadelphia in nineteen ninety two. Uh, but I found my way to uh, Southern New England with my husband, who's a heart surgeon, in 1993 and have practiced here since that time. It's been an exciting career for me. Um, breast surgery used to be the province of general surgeons, but as it's become more specialized, uh, this career of dedicated breast surgeons has emerged. And so for the last 18 years, I have been the fellowship director at uh, Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island for a breast fellowship, which takes general surgeons and gives them an additional year of training in breast specific disease. So we're, we're really happy to help women understand their breast health, as you said, and manage both uh, benign, um, infectious, as well as the malignant aspects of breast disease. Excellent, excellent. So there are some different recommendations out there for screening in regards to mammograms, and it depends on which recommendation that one looks at. So can you tell us a little bit about the current recommendations and and what you might recommend to our viewers out there? I think this has been one of the most confounding situations for for women and for providers, frankly, to figure out which of these guidelines to follow. Uh, The most liberal guidelines say that women don't need to consider screening until they're 50. Um, and that we could screen every other year, which means um, obtain a mammogram every other year. We'll just revisit for our our listeners that a screen test is a test we do to a woman who has no, or to a patient, and in this case, a woman who has no symptoms. Um, So we screen for blood pressure by checking your blood pressure when you come in for a visit. And we screen for breast cancer by getting mammograms when you have no symptoms. Um, so the most liberal screening regimen is a mammogram every other year, beginning at the age of 50. We would not recommend that screening regimen for a woman who had a family history of breast cancer. Uh, whenever there's family history of breast cancer, then we want to tailor the screening recommendations to the risk. Um, so every other year at 50 is, is different than what the American College of Radiology recommends or the American uh, Cancer Society Um and that's because those are two organizations, you know, heavily tied to treating um, and managing breast cancer. And though, so they've accepted the benefits of screening. And so both those organizations recommend annual mammograms every year for the average risk women uh, beginning as early as 40 from the College of Radiology or at 45 from the um, American Cancer Society. So I think you know, this is the tough burden that falls upon a primary care provider mm-hmm. and a woman in deciding, you know, which which way, way do I go? Um, what we like to remind uh, the general population of is that a mammogram is a very tiny dose of radiation. Um, it's been to- we've been told that it really is equivalent to the amount of ground ambient radiation one gets just walking around your daily life. Um, for about three weeks. So walking around Southern New England for about three weeks, you get the same dose of radiation as one mammogram Um, or flying across the country um, is the same dose of radiation. Um, But whether it's every other year or every year, 
we really have shown that women who participate in screening mammography have a reduction in death from breast cancer. Um, and that's just been shown by study after study. Um, and, and so that for these reasons, we recommend screening. Screening exam that hasn't been validated is a breast exam. Uh, so a breast exam is not a substitute for a mammogram. It can be used in conjunction, but it's a poor substitute for a mammogram. I'll pause there. So is that, a, you're talking about a self breast exam that, you know, like yeah, a breast self exam uh, hasn't been validated as an effective screening tool in a, in a uh, population that is eligible for mammographic screening. Mm. Um, but also an exam by a provider is not a substitute for a mammogram. By the time you're feeling like a little lump, a mammogram would have picked that up much earlier, right? So it's unusual that a, a woman will find a very little lump, but it does happen. I've had plenty of women who felt something and then went on to mammogram and had a small um, under an inch size cancer found. But in general, in the average breast, a mammogram will uncover a smaller lump than any fingers could ever identify. Okay. So when you're getting your yearly mammograms, like if, if you're pretty good and like boom, 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 you're getting them year after year after year after year, what's important too is is catching anything early, right? So are, if you're pretty good with that yearly schedule, you're going to get, you're going to catch something yearly. Like after your mammogram, like month eight or month nine, you're not going to probably be like stage three or something just because you're doing that yearly right. cadence, right? Right, so, so doing it yearly is the best guarantee to the early detection of breast cancer when it's most curable. Nice. Um, and I wanna keep answering your questions before we talk about the changes that 3D mammography has um, brought oh. us, but it seems like another common question a woman will say is, you know, the mammogram hurts, um, you know, breasts go into in between two sort of lucite type plates and the breast is compressed so they can get an adequate image. You know, can I do an ultrasound in, instead? My friend said she had the ultrasound and the ultrasound is what found her cancer. So can't I just do the ultrasound instead? And the answer to that is that an ultrasound of the breast is a very good tool for working up a finding that is felt or that is found on mammography, but it really is a poor screening test so a, a screening ultrasound has to use that handheld ultrasound probe and map out the entire volume of the breast searching for subtle signs of cancer. And, and while that can be done, it's, um, it's, very, it's a difficult approach and it's at risk for failure. So okay. we really try to avoid letting women use ultrasound for breast cancer screening. Okay. Dr. Goss, let me ask you one question. As a primary care physician, I've been using the every year starting at 40 guideline for since I started practice a long time ago. So that's what I do. And I've never really felt there was a downside to doing that. Um, is there a downside to doing it yearly starting at age 40? Um, so the theoretic downside would be um, a little bit more radiation. So mm -hmm. one has to decide what they feel about that radiation. But I think one of the big arguments that comes out from the US Preventive Task Force is the false positives. Um, and that these false positives um, lead to unnecessary workup and, and then particularly anxiety for women. Mm -hmm. um, so a false positive is, you know, and, and again, I like to go back to the blood pressure thing. Uh, when you come in and we check your blood pressure and it's high, we don't start you on medication right away. We bring you back, we check your blood pressure again, we try to take it at home. So, so all tests we do have this false positive rate. Mm -hmm. um, so a mammogram um, that's being interpreted by a, a dedicated breast imager can have a finding that looks suspicious. Thankfully now those don't lead to surgery, they lead to a image guided needle core biopsy. Mm -hmm. And those needle core biopsies can be benign. Um, in fact, for um, a mammogram that requires biopsy, we expect one cancer for every three, one out of four will be positive, 25%. So three mm -hmm. women will get a benign biopsy. So I, you know, if you're an epidemiologist and trying to manage unnecessary procedures for benefit, the idea is if we do it every other year, 
would we find more cancers and less unnecessary biopsies? Um, and that's a difficult question to answer. Um, but the short answer is that whether we look at every year or every other year, the same findings are gonna be there and they're still gonna need to be addressed. So it doesn't seem like every other year will reduce the false positives and you'll lose a little bit of early detection for the cancers that would have missed, been missed and found at 12 months that you don't find until 24 months. Mm. So maybe that's a long answer to your question. No, it's a, it's a great answer. And that I think that's how I've pretty much looked at it. I mean, there's this societal issue of resource utilization on one hand, and then, as you mentioned, the false positivity and anxiety that comes along with it. But, you know, having a late diagnosis of breast cancer is, is such a devastating um, issue that... Uh, it always has to be a sheer decision making with the patient, of course, but it seems to me that it makes sense to do it more regularly than every two years for for many patients. Probably when maybe as they if their if health is 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 failing and they're frail and older, maybe that changes things, of course. But um, I've seen certainly, and I'm sure you've seen a lot, much more than I. You know, 40 year olds with breast cancer, and um, you know we do see that a lot. And then you brought up the other really important point that's very difficult to discuss, but when a woman gets into her late 70s and 80s, then you know you really have to think hard about annual mammography and, and do you really want to uncover something that you can't feel and it's you know, the glass half full, half empty, of course, because they're older, you don't want to wait till something's big mm -hmm. and more difficult to manage, but also do you want to find something that's small and, and trivial? So. I think that's another difficult thing that falls onto a primary care provider. Yeah, these are difficult questions. So a lot of this is a conversation that has to take place with the, the patient. I mean, we can make recommendations, but at the end of the day, there has to be some shared decision making on all of this, it seems. So, Doctor, we talked a little bit about the false positives. Are, are there false negatives that you see? Oh, yes. So thank you for bringing that up. That's just a great segue into breast density and density guided screening. So um, a mammogram is, you know, a, a photographic type of image of the breast, and it's uh, an image that's really black and white. Um, and of course, there's all these shades of gray. Right. So in, in an ideal mammogram, uh, we're looking through, um, looking at a, a pattern of imagery, and we're looking for calcifications that are white, as you would imagine, but also densities, cancer, that is also white. When the breast is um, typically younger or just more glandular, the breast is a gland, um, there's more density to it. The x-rays penetrate it less well. And so therefore the background through which the radiologist is interpreting is whiter. The whiter it is, the more it can cloud the density that one's looking for. So a not bad analogy is if the sky is cloudy and you're searching for the sun, it's difficult to find. But when the clouds scatter, um, you know, the sun is more visible. That's a great so analogy. that's, so when a woman, so now um, for the last several years, radiologists have been required to categorize how dense a mammogram is and also notify oh. a patient of her breast density. So women whose breasts are more than 50% dense will get a letter saying your mammogram's dense and therefore it could obscure small masses mm -hmm. and you should talk to your provider about enhanced breast screening, which can include ultrasound or MRI. Um, and so I'd like to turn the question back because that must be one of the most ta challenging uh, questions you get from your patients. Sure. How, how do you, how do you address that? Yeah. Um, that's a really difficult one. I get that quite often. To be honest, I mean, very often I will send the person for a, a consultation um, with a, a breast specialist because I think they are certainly more expert at having this discussion than I am. So I do that often. Yeah. So we and we're happy to, to help with that. So we already talked about the challenges of whole breast ultrasound for screening, but this legislation made that become real. 
uh, that not every woman is going to get insurance coverage for a breast MRI. Mm -hmm. And she's being informed that her mammogram might miss her cancer. So now women go for these double bilateral whole breast ultrasounds because their mammogram is dense. And that, and with that technique, we have shown that ultrasound can uncover cancers that the mammogram missed. Um, in one series of women who had dense breasts, who were average risk for breast cancer, if you took a thousand women who were screened, that means they were asymptomatic, the mammogram picked up four cancers and the ultrasound after the mammogram picked up an additional two to three cancers per thousand. Oh, wow. Exactly. So you're saying that's mm. doing almost as well as the mammogram. Um, so this, this is the data that we try to sift through and use to counsel our patients. Um, breast MRI has been recommended by the American Cancer Society for women who have an elevated lifetime risk of breast cancer and they define elevated as a 20% <clears throat> lifetime risk. So fortunately, um, a tool has been validated called the Tired Cusick Risk Model that's available online to providers. And that takes a number of patient-specific risk factors, puts them into a formula, and can deliver our best ability to estimate a woman's lifetime risks. Mm -hmm. So when we see women, with breast density, we take the history elements we need um, and put them into this tool and develop our lifetime risk of breast cancer. If it's greater than 20%, then we counsel her that she should have insurance coverage for an MRI for screening. And then she can do that MRI annually at the time of her mammogram, or she can choose to space it six months from her mammogram. For women who fall below the 20% threshold, then they um, are counseled that our best tool for them that will be covered by insurance is a whole breast ultrasound. Uh, and that is almost uniformly covered by insurance as well. Again, timing it with the mammogram or six months subsequent um, based on patient preference, really. Just okay. out of curiosity, are these tools incorporated into the electronic health record? Uh, like, uh, you know, you, you talk about them, and, and you're aware of them because you have this specialty, but it, is a tool like that incorporated? And, or is it would, be, would it be a tool you use, or is it just, yeah. uh, uh, you know, available to the specialists? Right. So, so that's such a great question. So women who get this assessment have already somehow have breast interest, right? If they're coming to a breast surgeon to discuss their screening, they're okay. interested. Um, or they have breast cancer, or they have a breast problem. But <clears throat> the radiologists have sort of uh, come to the uh, table and said, well, what about the woman who, who doesn't know what her risk is? How, right. how does she get exactly. that information? And so some women or some uh, breast imaging centers are incorporating this cancer risk assessment uh, at yes. when they have women sitting in their mammography suite waiting for their annual mammogram. Mm. That's great. Uh, but I think your point is even more important, um, which is, well, what about the women who aren't going for mammograms, who aren't aware of what their breast cancer risk right. is? Right. And we really, um, to my understanding, haven't tapped into that larger population. So um, that's a great question. What percentage of women who are eligible for mammograms don't have screening? I, I don't know the answer to this but I, I bet it's and higher than I think. I, yeah, it, it, right. Um, well, right, all women who are over 40 are eligible for mammograms and, and not all women attend. So I think, I think it's okay that that woman is still talking to her PCP about getting a mammogram or not. I think that does, Linda, kick into the EMR when you're seeing a patient. Mm -hmm. I think there are prompts that say this woman's eligible for mammography based on age alone. Is she getting it? If she's choosing not to get the mammogram, there's probably not much of a reason to talk to her about enhanced screening because she won't even go for the mammogram. Um, does that make sense? It does. I, I just, I always wonder, I, I think sometimes what we see in medicine is like the tip of the iceberg. I think there's this whole group of patients that don't even seek medical care in general unless they're really ill. So they're not doing preventative care. Um, so I, I I, I suspect there are a fair amount of women out there who aren't getting screened. I wish I knew the number. I don't, but. 
And I guess the question is, how do we reach them? Maybe this right. podcast is one way to reach them. <laughs> right. So, so I guess taking another step back, we talked about risk factors for breast cancer. What are some of the risk factors that women should know about that would put them at increased risk? Yes. Well, the, the biggest risk factor we know is family history. Um, there are other risk factors uh, that we talk about a lot that these tools measure. So, so risk factors that go into that lifetime risk assessment include when did your menstrual cycle start? When did you have a, a full-term pregnancy? Um, but these are subtle risk factors that aren't really modifiable. Mm -hmm. Modifiable risk factors are things you counsel your patients about because they're healthy lifestyle risk factors. So avoidance of smoking and regular exercise, a healthy diet. And again, they're subtle. Mm -hmm. The most powerful risk factors are your genetics. And so one thing we could cover on the podcast is that particular uh, family history risk factors mean that you could be eligible for cancer genetic testing. And I think as most of our listeners will know, genetic testing is, is pretty simple these days. You can get a kit from Ancestry. You can get a, kiss, a kit from 23andMe. Um, or you can get a medical kit uh, that goes to a medical lab that will analyze your cancer genes and see if you're at increased risk for breast cancer. So if there's a woman who has a family history of early onset breast cancer under the age of 50 in her family, if there's metastatic prostate cancer, ovary cancer, or pancreatic cancer, these are the four cancers for which that history alone in your um, close relatives, first, second, or third degree, mother, sister, grandmother, but even aunt, um, that would meet criteria for cancer testing. And we can find cancer genes that could mean you don't begin breast cancer screening at, at 40. It might mean you begin breast cancer screening as early as 25. Mm -hmm. So that's a really important point you made about the the familial cancers, so to speak, or the genetic link. Could you repeat to our for our audience those cancers again, that if family members were to have in an early age would be a, a trigger to perhaps look into this a little further? Because I think it's a great point. Yeah, ovary cancer, um, mm. but now pancreatic cancer, um, metastatic prostate cancer, and then early onset, so breast cancer under the age of 50. Mm. So there's um, a blood test that will pick up if I, um, what am I, you know what I'm thinking of, mm -hmm. um, that people will opt to have a, a double mastectomy. Um, so where is that fit in, in in today's, like just with how people are thinking about breast health today? So I think you're thinking of Angelina Jolie. Yes. And so Angelina Jolie had a family history and her mother of breast and ovary cancer. And um, she opted to do the BRCA gene test. Okay. And that's that hereditary breast ovary cancer genetic mutation. Yeah. She learned she had the mutation. And so she did a prophylactic double mastectomy. And then, you know, as importantly, she did a prophylactic removal of her tubes and ovaries. Um, even for BRCA mutation carriers, they can choose to screen for breast cancer, but we can't screen effectively for ovary cancer. Mm. Uh -huh. um, and so when we find a BRCA mutation, the most important thing we counsel our patients about is preventative removal of their tubes and ovaries between the ages of 35 and 45, depending on the details of the mutation. Okay. And that's a that's life-saving. So interestingly to me, as a breast cancer surgeon, I think more about prophylactic tube and ovary removal for my BRCA patients than a pro prophylactic mastectomy, because mm -hmm. the form of the tubes and ovary is life-altering and saving. Um, huh. And the mastectomy, <clears throat> again, if we screened that woman appropriately, we'd hopefully find her cancer early. Mm -hmm. oh, that's interesting. So I've had a number of yeah. patients who've, who've been screened, and um, it's, sometimes it's a challenge to get the insurance to cover it, but most of the time, if there's the appropriate family history, we can, we can achieve that and get it done. But you had mentioned before, and I had never really thought about this, but the genetic screening that's offered commercially through, say, you know, 23andMe and all that, is, is, that, a, is, that, is that good testing? I don't know much about uh, it, quite honestly. <laughs> 
Yeah, I'm, I wanted to double back to that. So thank you. And it's, um, it is the testing they do is reliable, but it's not, it is not comprehensive cancer genetic testing. I think it's 23andMe that covers the three BRCA mutations that are known to be in the Jewish community, the Ashkenazi Jewish community, but it doesn't cover all the BRCA mutations. So a woman or a family member can be misinformed to show that they don't have any mutation by 23andMe, but it was only limited sampling. I see. So it's not um, comprehensive, and it's good that our, our listeners hear that. So they should really have a, a true medical screen if they're really at risk and that family history exists. Correct. Right. Okay. Dr. Can we go back a little bit? When you're viewing um, results of a mammogram and it's it, it comes back positive, what are the most common positive results of a mammogram that you're seeing and, and what's the follow-up for those? That's a great question. So um, the most common cancer we find is invasive cancer. Okay. Invasive cancer is the cancer that we fear the most. Um, it's the cancer that can metastasize and can ultimately become stage four and life-threatening. So the value of mammography is finding those cancers while they're still contained within the breast so that we can treat them and their risk for metastatic disease and prevent breast cancer death. That finding is going to be a mass on a mammogram, a density or a mass that starts with a screening mammogram. It usually leads to a callback diagnostic study where the mammogram is repeated and it's focused on the area of interest and it's augmented with an ultrasound. Once that report is complete, the patient will return yet again for a third visit where a needle biopsy is performed, and then a little clip is placed into the biopsied area um, to sh- prove that that area was assessed. Okay. That uh, <laughs> tissue goes to the lab and is analyzed. And so that density then is either categorized as a, a benign growth um, or fibrocystic benign changes or a cancer. Um, The other important mammographic finding is calcifications, and calcifications are, uh, again, can be benign and be fibrocystic change, uh, a layman's term, but still a useful term. Um, But occasionally, uh, in 25% of the cases, calcifications can be malignant, and they can be this subtype of breast cancer that is trapped within the duct still, and therefore called stage zero. Oh. There's a little bit of medical controversy right now about does all stage zero breast cancer need treatment? Could we kind of think of breast cancer the way we think of early prostate cancer? And could we observe it for a little bit rather than doing surgery? Um, and those studies are really ongoing, proving the safety of expected management of non-invasive cancer. Um, that would weigh on my mind. The, mm. Yeah. Previously, the the thought process had been that, look, we found it at its earliest stage. Let's get it out before it has a chance to become worse. Right. Um, And that's where we we pretty much remain. Um, uh, But that's why those trials are ongoing, trying to establish um, if observation would be reasonable. Uh, Just as a quick side note, you know, obviously breast cancer surgery is a totally different experience for a woman than prostate cancer surgery for a right. man. Mm-hmm. Um, they're just radically different levels of intervention. Right. So can you just review what the stages are for our audience, for people listening that may not be familiar with that terminology? Yeah. So there, that's important because lots of times with patient portals now, mm-hmm. patients will see their pathology before yes. their doctor has discussed right. it with them. Right. So when a needle biopsy results on a patient portal, a grade is gonna be given with the diagnosis. And the grade is an assessment of how the cells look under the microscope by the pathologist. Okay. Um, so we grade cells from grade one as a low grade to grade three as a high grade. Grade is not stage, grade is just cellular appearance under the microscope by the pathologist. Um, and it's, uh, Uh, categorized by the degree of abnormality of the nuclei and the rate of division mitoses, the rate of reproduction of the cells. Stage is how extensive is the cancer. So we talked about non-invasive breast cancer, and I often really emphasize to my patients, this is stage zero. 
Okay. Uh, because zero is a powerful sound to it. You know, Coke zero, zero calories, zero risk. <laughs> uh, so I, I, I like that verbiage. And then the invasive cancers are stage one through stage four. We're, we're lucky that we don't have a lot of women who present with stage four breast cancer, which means it was missed while it was limited to the breast and we find it when it's already spread to other organ sites. Okay. So most breast cancer is diagnosed from stage one to stage three. Stage one is breast cancer limited to the breast or microscopic involvement of underarm lymph nodes. Stage two is when a breast cancer is in the breast, but maybe a medium size or with early lymph node involvement. And then stage three is larger disease in the breast um, or significant lymph node involvement. But for stage one through stage three, we always treat with um, curative intent because even with advanced breast cancer, um, there is a proportion of women who get complete cure uh, and it, it involves more treatment. Okay. When When is um, surgical intervention required? Yeah. So most women with breast cancer um, do have surgery to remove the cancer from their breasts. So the one group that doesn't routinely get surgery is stage four. Okay. Uh, if the cancer has escaped the breast already. So surgery for stage four breast cancer is less common. But most women with stage th zero through stage three breast cancer will have surgery as part of their treatment. The more advanced the cancer is, stage two and stage three, then treatment can begin with medical drug therapy, chemotherapy or uh, chemotherapy drugs that are oral. Um, but surgery, again, is, is usually part of curative, comprehensive therapy for stage zero through stage three. And breast surgery has really changed a lot, too. I mean, it used to be not too many years ago, uh, it was the woman got a mastectomy, and that's what was offered. And now there's a lot of breast conserving therapy that, that goes on. Maybe you could just mention a little bit about that. It was so exciting um, because really through screening mammography and finding cancers smaller and smaller, um, that idea of you don't need to remove the entire breast, you just need to remove the disease has come to fruition. Even though we were able to offer breast conserving surgery in the 80s and 90s, if the disease was bigger, the surgery deforming the breast was still rather significant. In, 20, in the 2000s and certainly in 2020, when mammograms are finding cancers that are under an inch in size, the surgery that we do is much less disfiguring. We talk about hiding our scars um, and we really work to, to deliver a result where at the end of treatment, the patient might not look at herself and, and see that her breast is scarred and deformed and, and maybe it doesn't look too dramatically different. Mm. And today, also breast surgery is advanced in <clears throat> moving away from the full lymph node dissection, which caused the big swollen arm and the lymphedema right. that's so scary to, to many people. Yeah. And now we have a selective way we remove just a few lymph nodes from the underarm that's highly accurate and been proven safe for the, in the Thank God. for now 20 years of follow-up. So now if you're doing um, a lumpectomy, and you're noticing that now your breasts are different sizes, you can get some reconstruction to take care of that if you so choose to, correct? Yeah, that was a very important legislation in the late 90s um, that said that women should not need to live with deformity um, mm -hmm. as breast cancer survivors. So as you said, if maybe you had a lumpectomy two or three years ago and things seemed okay then, but now you're noting that the scar is retracting or the treated breast is getting smaller and you feel uneven, um, your insurance should cover uh, plastic surgeon guided symmetrization, you know, uh, a surgery to make everything more even. Mm. For someone that um, has an advanced stage and does need uh, a mastectomy, um, how easy is it to reconstruct a breast afterwards? So when a breast cancer is advanced and requires mastectomy, um, there may be even a role for radiation with mastectomy. Um, so we used to be a little bit more restrictive in radiation after mastectomy, but the best data for the last 10 years has shown us that if there's lymph node involvement, radiation probably needs to be part of the treatment plan. And so therefore women who have a mastectomy uh, that's a, for advanced cancer, which generally means lymph node involvement, will often get post-mastectomy radiation. In that setting, we'll recommend delayed reconstruction of course. Uh, because the patient's gonna 
live with her reconstruction for the rest of her life. And we, there's just really no reason to radiate it um, as part, you know, by doing an immediate reconstruction right, right. and then subject the reconstruction to radiation. So that's changed in the last 15 years for my practice where we tried to get every woman to immediate reconstruction. Now, because there's more post mastectomy radiation, we do more delayed reconstruction. Yeah. Um, but a good candidate for an immediate reconstruction is a woman with early breast cancer that may cover, even though it's early, it may span a larger region of her breast. It may be non-invasive, but it may cover a larger region of her breast. And we've decided that breast conserving surgery would be deforming. And so she may get, you know, a skin and potentially nipple sparing mastectomy with an, an immediate reconstruction. Reconstruction can be done in two ways in general, um, with your own tissue, which we call autologous yeah. smear tissue versus implant-based. Okay. Um, and that, that's just a, a decision-making process with the patient and her plastic surgeon. So are there, so that actually brings me to the question I had, is this always the role of a plastic surgeon or is it, I would think it's something that you do in, in breast surgery also? Or am so I the wrong? reconstruction component of it is almost always done by a plastic surgeon. Okay. There are a few breast cancer surgeons who are also plastic surgery trained and do their own reconstruction. Um, but most breast reconstruction is done by a plastic surgeon. Okay. So when the patient meets a breast cancer surgeon, um, the breast cancer surgeon will discuss you know, the options. And even when the reconstruction might be delayed, we'll often suggest a plastic consult um, prior just so that the patient does have every benefit of every expert reviewing the best treatment plan for her. Doctor, when we had talked about stages earlier, stage one, two, three, four, at what point, and maybe there's some overlap with this, but when does chemotherapy enter the picture? Oh, that's such a great question, and it's so much more complicated than it used to be. <laughs> I know. It's not going to be a simple answer, right? <laughs> well, it's a, it's a good answer, though, right? I mean, the good answer is that uh, the researchers have gotten so much better about understanding which woman really benefits from chemotherapy. So I don't think, you know, the year 2000 was too long ago. It sounds like modern era to me, even though it's 20 years ago. But in 2000, if a woman had cancer in a lymph node, she was breast cancer in a lymph node, she was probably going to get chemotherapy. That was the state of the art. That was the N National Cancer Institute recommendation. If your cancer was in a lymph node or if your cancer was larger than a centimeter, there was a 2% survival advantage to chemotherapy. So even for our favorable estrogen driven cancers, um, we do chemotherapy. So thank goodness, you know, the researchers um, wanted to change this. And so we came up with this genomic profile tool called, um, the most common one has a brand name called Oncotype. There are other types, Mammoprint, but basically we take a sample of your cancer, we send it to a lab and they look at up and down regulation of genes in the cancer. And what the research has been able to solidly support is that women with um, certain gene profiles in estrogen positive HER2 negative breast cancer, women, which is the most common subtype, women with a certain gene profile get no benefit from chemotherapy. Mm. So now uh, we limit chemotherapy to women who um, have more extensive node involvement, um, greater than three to four positive nodes, um, estrogen negative cancers, which are known to be, you know, I don't want to say bad actors, but a, a cancer subtype where chemotherapy is required. Okay. And then this other funny receptor called HER2. And, and I say to my patient, I said, I don't really know if I want to be HER2 positive or not, because HER2 positive cancers have the best targeted therapy we have to offer. And there's more research coming up with more treatment options. So when one fails, there's another one around the corner. Um, but HER2 positive cancer does need chemo. Right. Um, so, you know, yeah, all things said, sense. I'd like to have a cancer that doesn't need chemo to cure me. Um, and so, so the complex answer is that um, <laughs> a lot of node positive breast cancer and cancers that are even 
three to four or five centimeters in size that we used to always treat with chemo now get successful curative therapy that doesn't require chemo. That's great. Right. When we were talking about follow-up um, before, uh, can you explain to me what a liquid biopsy is? Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, that's like the holy grail. I don't know why we all think that blood tests are easier than other tests we go for, but but they're kind of commonly accepted by the public as, as, I, as I hear it. Um, and so a liquid biopsy is the idea that why can't, with, with modern technology, with all that we have, have achieved, why can't we get a blood sample and look for breast cancer right. in the blood? Well, why, why can't we do that? And so that's what a liquid biopsy is. And there's a lot of research uh, looking at selectively finding cancer cells in the blood and being able to, to distinguish them from other cells. And that's where the research gets you know, high end and high tech uh, because that's harder to do than it seems like it ought to be. But the short answer is that's harder to do than it ought to be. And so we just aren't successful yet in, in, in that, in either screening women for breast cancer right. with liquid biopsy or screening for recurrence. And the latter, I will probably get to before the former, because in the ideal setting, we'd find breast cancer before it's in our bloodstream with the mammogram. Uh, yeah, it's it's funny. I mean, uh, along the same lines, I get this question as a primary care doctor all the time. I want to get all the blood tests I can so I make sure I don't have cancer. So, I mean, I wish it was that simple, right? We just do a bunch of blood tests and we would know you'd screen out every potential cancer there was. If only it was that simple. We didn't talk too much about 3D mammography, I don't think. And we'll be taking a step back with this question, but it's such an important point. Maybe we can talk a little bit about it. So, so, yeah, I didn't cover it when we talked about breast density. So when this breast density problem was presenting itself to radiologists, they, they weren't ignoring this problem. Uh, we're looking at a mammogram. The woman's high risk. Her breast is dense. You know, what else can we do? And so some, some radiologists, uh, researchers went down, well, can we use other technology? Uh, but one research group said, well, well, can we improve the mammogram? When we do the mammogram, we're putting it between two plates. We're taking a single image. How come we can't CAT scan the breast? Right. Uh, and so a, a <clears throat> tomosynthesis mammography is the attempt to CAT scan the breast. Uh, we don't give intravenous contrast, uh, but we do take slices through the breast. And it's tremendous. We just did a study at, um, in Providence looking at the power of cancer detection using 3D tomosynthesis versus 2D digital mammography. And we've seen a, a downsizing of cancer, an average size of 15 to 17 millimeters on 2D to now an average size of eight to nine millimeters wow. on 3D. And the other crazy thing is that as we find these cancers smaller and smaller, they've had less time to grow. Right. And that as they grow, they change their characteristics. So perhaps it's true that not every cancer starts out as grade three. Maybe they start out as grade one or two, but as they're given time to grow in the breast before we detect them, they obtain mutations that make them become grade three and then, make, and then give them time to metastasize. And so preliminary data from Brown suggests that yes, 3D mammography has a higher rate of small cancers and favorable low-grade cancers. Mm. Will that eventually become the scanning tool of choice then? I think it's, um, you know, the, the challenge of it, unfortunately, is that it takes more time to get it and a little bit more time to read. Um, but I think the radiologists have been able to petition for a higher compensation rate for reading a, a tougher exam. Um, so... I do think it should become the standard. Are they still squishing you? <laughs> yes. <they're still> squishing. <laughs> Some people say there's a little bit less compression because the radio because mm. they know they're going to get the slices. Right. Um, so about, it should hurt a little bit less. How about the radiation exposure with that compared to typical mammography? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the radio. So what the radiologists like to say is that um, when you could compare it to a film mammogram, which is where we started, and we compared radiation dosing and survival. 
Um, it's still lower than a old fashioned film mammography, but it's um, um, more than a 2D mammogram. Okay. And so some, some facilities have been stratified to say, okay, well, if, our mam if, our pa if we have a patient population whose mammogram isn't dense, we'll let them do the 2D route and save the 3D just for the dense mammogram. Okay. Can I ask you one quick question from something you had said before? You had mentioned that during a biopsy, they, they um, put a little clip in you to mark the area. Yes. Does, does that clip stay inside me forever? Yes, you know, that's a really good question because sometimes women will not want the clip to be placed. And I'm not sure what the universal or, or nationwide perspective on that is. I know that um, some of the radiologists with whom I work in, uh, at Brown will um, almost nearly ref refuse to do a biopsy if they can't place a clip. And what their fear is, is if the biopsy causes distortion, if there's bleeding with the biopsy that causes a hematoma, right. and if they don't have a reliable way to get back to where that lesion was found and biopsied, um, the it's care could disadvantage. be um, mm. yeah, um, challenged. Um, so I, I think I think that they it would take a little bit more counseling because obviously you don't want something that's clearly a cancer to not undergo a biopsy. But some of the more subtle findings that are suggestive of cancer but not diagnostic, um, they, they really need that clip. And then your question was, will it stay inside you for the rest of your life? And the answer is yes. Um, it's a titanium clip. It's um, under. It's about the size of a grain of rice. Um, and it, we, we're just not aware that they, they bother you at all. Uh, well, I guess people who have um, cardiac disease have, have stents placed in their coronary arteries. Mm -hmm. We put clips and brain aneurysms. Um, and so there are a lot of places we place little teeny metal things into our bodies uh, that don't track us, <laughs> but, but, <laughs> but they're life-saving. No, I was, I was asking because mm -hmm. if, if I go for an MRI, and am, I, am I microwaving myself? Like, no. <laughs> you know? Yes, yeah, so they're titanium, <laughs> they're and titanium. so they don't interact with the MRI. Okay, yeah, perfect. That's, the beauty that's where it. I was getting. I didn't want to be like <laughs> wow. heating up. So I, I think, unfortunately, we're getting towards the end yeah. of our, our discussion. But this has been really wonderful. I mean, I have learned a lot, and I'm sure all yeah, of our viewers have learned a lot also. I want to thank you so much. Is there any one message you'd like to leave our audience with? I think we started with it. Um, and so I was happy to hear that you believe in uh, mammography uh, at beginning, beginning at age 40. Mm -hmm. um, I believe in that too, but what's more important than beginning at age 40 is, is you can start at any time. There's, there, just because you didn't start at 50 uh, or 40 doesn't mean it's not time to go now. The average age of breast cancer is 60. Okay. And breast cancer is most curable when we find it on a mammogram. So send yourself or your loved ones for mammogram if they're eligible. And if there's cancer in your family, um, talk to your PCP about it and decide if cancer genetic testing is for you. Great. Great. Thank Dr. you so Dr. much. Dr. Goss, thank you so much. You're, you're incredibly knowledgeable. This was a wonderful discussion. If anyone from our audience wants to um, contact you for a consultation or whatnot, how would they do that? Um, I'm at Primacare, uh, delivering breast cancer consultations um, in Fall River weekly. Um, so we have an office there with a um, Massachusetts-based uh, telephone exchange. And then I'm also in Providence um, the other days right. of the week. And we can, get, we can get those numbers up later on, so yep. we'll, we'll get those out. So once thank again, thank you so much for participating and, and educating us on this important topic. I want to thank, of course, our sponsor, Bay Coast Bank, which is just right for all of your financial needs. Visit Bay Coast Bank. I'm sorry, baycoast.bank or call 508-678-7641 to learn more. This is Chris and Nancy, the 27th degree from 27 Degrees Consulting. Take care, everyone, and we'll see you again in another couple of weeks. Thank you. Thank you.